Hi guys. I know it's weird and early in the morning, so let's see if any of you guys actually come to this or not. Um, and I don't need my glasses to read close up, so I'm taking them off. I apologize if I look strange, because I do look strange without glasses on. Um, so we, hey, someone's here, yay. Who are you, person who's here? I lied, I'm gonna keep them on. <clears throat> uh, okay, so we are starting on page 30 today. Hey, Sam. Um, we are gonna um, keep going from where we were yesterday. So far, we have learned a couple of things. We uh, have learned that, hey, Tyler, she too. Uh, <clears throat> so we've learned a couple of things. Um, we know that Day is in California. He's in San Francisco with Eden. And he's there because he is getting treatment for his brain thing that is causing him headaches. The doctor says he's dying. Um, June is now a princeps elect, which means she's one of the people being considered to be the leader of the Senate. So she and two other people are in training right now. Commander Jameson and Thomas have both been uh, sentenced to death by execution for their crimes against the Republic. And Razor already has been executed for his crimes against the um, Republic. Um, <clears throat> I did say I was gonna use a tablet, I'm using my phone, um, because I can't seem to get the file onto the nook. <laughs> this file just won't go. So I'm gonna call Miss Reamer and see if she can help me because apparently I'm incompetent. So she'll help me and we'll figure it out. Um, so the last part we're at there, right at the very end of the last chapter was um, Commander Jameson basically saying like, you are horrible to Andon and like, you are just like your father, you're gonna fail, everyone's gonna hate you. She was like taunting him and June made it seem like it was like, a like she felt like she, that Jameson was threatening them. So that's where we're at right now. They've invited Day back to a party and a banquet um, so that they can talk to him about possibly using Eden to make vaccines against the plague because Eden has had it already. They're gonna try to use his blood. So we'll talk more about that probably. So page 30, <clears throat> day. We touched down in Denver in the morning of the emergency banquet. Even the words themselves make me wanna laugh. Emergency banquet. To me, a banquet still means a feast. I don't see how an emergency could be caused for a gaudy mountain of food even if it is for Independence Day. Is that how these senators deal with crises? Stick by stuffing their fat faces? After Eden and I settle into a temporary government apartment and Eden dozes off, exhausted from our early morning flight, I reluctantly leave him with Lucy in order to meet the assistant assigned to prep me for tonight's event. If anyone tries to see him, I whisper to Lucy as Eden sleeps for any reason, please call me. If anyone wants, Lu Lucy, used to my paranoia, hushes me with a wave of her hand. Let me put your mind at ease, Mr. Wing, she replies. She pats my cheek. No one will see Eden while you're gone, I promise. I'll call you in an instant if anything happens. I nod. My eyes linger on Eden, as if he'll disappear if I blink. Thanks. To attend an event this fa fancy, I need to dress the part. And to dress the part, the Republic assigns a senator's daughter to take me through the downtown district, where the city's main shopping areas are clustered. She meets me right where the train stops in the center of the district. There's no mistaking who it is. She's decked out in a stylish uniform from head to toe. Her light brown eyes set against dark brown skin and thick black curls of hair tied up into a knotted braid. When she recognizes me, she flashes me, at, flashes me a smile. I catch her looking me over as if already critiquing my outfit. You must be Day, she says, taking my hand. My name is Faelene Fidelma and the lecturers assigned me to be your guide. <clears throat> she pauses to raise an eyebrow at my clothes. <laughs> we have some work to do. I look down at my outfit, trousers tucked into scuffed up boots, a rumpled collar shirt, and an old scarf. Would have been considered luxurious on the streets. Glad you approve, I reply. But Faelene just laughs and loses her arm around mine. 
As she leads me to a government clothing street that specializes in evening wear, I take in the crowds of people rushing around us. Well-dressed upper-class folk. A trio of students pass, giggling about something or other, dressed in pristine military uniforms and polished boots. As we round a corner and step inside a shop, I realize that soldiers are standing guard up and down the street. A lot of soldiers. Are there usually this many guards downtown? I ask Faleen. She just shrugs and holds up an outfit against me, but I can see the unease in her eyes. No, she replies, not really, but I'm sure it's nothing for you to worry about. I let it drop, but a pulse of anxiety rushes through my mind. Denver's beefing up its defenses. June hasn't explained why she needed me to attend this banquet so badly, badly enough to contact me herself after so many months of no word. What the hell could she need from me? What does the Republic want this time? If the Republic really was going back to war, then maybe I should find a way to get Eden out of the country. We have the power to leave now, after all. Don't know what's keeping me here. Hours later, after the sun has set and fireworks for the elector's birthday have already started going off in random parts of the city, a jeep, a jeep takes me from our apartment towards Coburn Hall. I peer impatiently out the wall of the window. People travel up and down the sidewalks in dense clusters. Tonight, each of them is dressed in very specific clothing, mostly red, with hints of gold makeup and Republic seals stamped prominently here and there, on the back of white gloves or on the sleeves of military coats. I wonder how many of these folks agreed with Andon is our safe agreed with the and and is our savior graffiti and how many side with the and and is a hoax message grover lay down you're so annoying <laughs> sorry he's jingling like crazy um da, 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 now I lost my spot. troops march up and down the streets all the jumbotrons have images of enormous republic seals on display followed by live footage streaming from the festivities happening inside coburn hall to Andon's credit, there's been a steady decline in Republic propaganda lately on the Jumbotrons. Still no news about the outside world, though. I guess you can't have everything. By the time we reach the, co the cobbled step of Colburn Hall, the, hill the streets are a mess of celebrations, throngs of people, and some unsmiling guards. The onlookers let out a huge cheer when they see me step out of the Jeep, a roar that shakes my bones and sends a spasm of pain through the back of my head. I wave hesitantly back. Jaylene's waiting for me at the bottom of the steps that lead to the Coburn Hall. This time, she's clad in a gold dress, and gold dust shimmers on her eyelids. We exchange bows before I follow behind her, looking on as she motions for others to clear a path. You clean up nicely, she says. Someone's going to be very pleased to see you. I don't think the Elector will be as excited as you think. She smiles at me over her shoulder. I wasn't talking about the Elector. My heart jumps at that. We make our way through the shouting mob. I crane my neck and stare at this elaborate beauty of Coburn Hall. Everything glitters. Tonight, the pillars are each adorned with a tall, with tall scarlet banners displaying the Republic's seal. A hang right in the middle of the pillars and above the hall's entrance is the largest portrait I've ever seen, and his giant face. Faleen guides me down the corridor where senators are, are carrying on random conversations and other elite guests talk and laugh with one another like everything in the country is going great. But behind their cheerful masks are signs of nervousness flickering eyes and furrowed brows. They've got to sense the unusual number, number of soldiers here too. I try to mimic the proper precise way they have of walking and talking, but stop when Faye notices me doing it. We wander the lush open setting of Coburn Hall for several minutes, lost in a sea of politicians. The tassels of my epaulets clink together. I'm looking for her, even though I don't know what I'll say when, if I find her. How will I even catch a glimpse of her in the middle of all this gaudy luxury? Wherever we turn, I see another flurry of colorful gowns and polished suits, fountains and pianos, waiters carrying skinny glasses of champagne, fancy people wearing their face, fake smiles. I feel a sudden sense of claustrophobia. Where am I? What am I doing here? As if on cue, the instant I ask myself these questions is the instant I finally see her. Somehow, in the midst of these aristocrats who blend into one blurry portrait, my eyes catch her silhouette and pause. June. The noise around me fades into a dull hum, quiet and uninteresting, and all of my attention turns helplessly to the girl I thought I'd be able to face. She's dressed in a floor-length gown of deep scarlet, and her thick, shining hair is piled high on her head in dark waves, pinned into place with red, gem-studded combs that catch the light. She's the most beautiful girl I've ever seen, easily the most breathtaking, easily the most breathtaking girl in the room. She's grown taller in the eight months since I've seen her, and the way she holds herself, poised and graceful with her slender, 
swan-like neck and her deep, dark eyes is the image of perfection. Almost perfection. At closer look, I notice something that makes me frown. There's an air of restraint about her, something uncertain and unconfident. Not like the June I know. As if powerless against the sight, I find myself guiding both Faelene and me toward her. I only stop when the people around her move apart, revealing the man standing at her side. It's Andon. Of course, I shouldn't be surprised. Off to the side, several well-dressed girls are trying in vain to catch his attention, but he seems focused only on June. I watch as he leans in to whisper something in her ear, then continues his relaxed conversation with her and several others. When I turn silently away, Faelene frowns at my sudden shift. Are you okay? She asks. I attempt a reassuring smile. Oh, absolutely. Don't worry. I feel so out of place among these aristocrats with their bank accounts and posh manners. No matter how much money the Republic throws at me, I will forever be the boy from the streets. And I'd forgotten that a boy from the streets is no match for the future princeps. June. <clears throat> 1935 hours, Coburn Hall, main ballroom, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. I think I see day in the crowd, a flash of white gold hair, of bright blue eyes. My attention suddenly breaks from my conversation with Andon and the other princeps Alex, and I crane my eyes, crane my neck, hoping to get a better look. But he's not again, if he was ever there. Disappointed, I return my gaze to the others and give them my well-rehearsed smile. Will Day show up tonight? Surely Andon's men would have alerted us if Day had refused to get on the private jet for sent for him this morning. But he'd sounded so distant and awkward over the mic that night. Perhaps he just decided it wasn't worth coming out here at all. Maybe he hates me, now that we've decided to not... Now that we've had enough time apart for him to think clearly about our friendship. I scan the crowd again with the other princeps elects when the other princeps elects are, are laughing at Andon's jokes. I feel in my stomach, a feeling in my stomach tells me day will be here, but I'm hardly a person who relies on gut instinct. I absently touch the jewels in my hair, making sure they're all still in the right places. They're not the most comfortable things I've ever worn, but the hairdresser has gasped at how the rubies stood out against my dark locks. And that reaction was enough for me to think that they're worth the trouble. I'm not sure why I bothered to look so nice for tonight. It is Independence Day, I suppose, and the occasion is a large one. Miss Apparis is as precocious as we all assumed she would be, Andon's saying to the senders now, turning his smile on me. His apparent happiness is all for show, of course. I've shadowed Andon for long enough now to know when he's tense, and tonight the nervousness reflects off every gesture he makes. I'm nervous, too. A month from now, the Republic might have colonies' flags flying over their cities. Her tutors say they've never seen a student progress so rapidly through their political texts. Thank you, Elector, I reply automatically to his compliment. The senators both chuckle, but underneath their jolly expressions lies the lingering resentment they have against me. This child who has been tapped by the Elector to potentially become their leader one day. Mariana gives me a diplomatic, albeit stern, nod, but Serge doesn't look too pleased in, in the way. But Serge doesn't look pl too pleased with the way Andon singles me out. I ignore the dark scowl that the sender casts in my direction. His scowls used to bother me. Now I'm just tired of them. Ah, oh, well, Senator Tanaka of California tugs on the collar of his military jacket and exchanges a look with his wife. That's wonderful news, Elector. Of course, I'm sure the tutors also know how much of a senator's job is learned outside of the texts and from years of experience in the Senate chamber. Like our dear Senator Carmichael here. He pauses to nod graciously at Serge, who puffs up. Andon waves off his concern. Of course, he echoes, all in good time, Senator. Beside me, Mariana sighs, leans over, and tilts her chin at Serge. If you stare at his head long enough, it might sprout wings and take flight, she mutters. I smile at that. They steer off the topic and onto the topic, steer off the topic of me and onto the topic of how to better sort the students into high schools now that the trials are discontinued. The political chatter grates on my nerves. I start scanning the crowd again for day. After more futile searching, I finally put a hand on Andon's arm and lean over to whisper, excuse me, I'll be right back. He nods in return. <clears throat> when I turn away and start blending in with the crowd, I can feel his stare lingering on me. I spend several minutes walking the ballroom in vain, greeting various senators and their families as I go. Where is day? I try to hear snatches of conversation or notice where clusters of people might be gathering. Day is a celebrity. He must be attracting attention if he's already arrived. I'm about to make my way across the other half of the ballroom when I'm interrupted by loudspeakers. The pledge. I sigh. 
then turn back to where Andon has already taken his place on the front stage, flanked on both sides by soldiers holding up the Republic flags. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the Republic of America. Day, there he is. He's standing about 50 feet away, his back partially turned to me so I can only see a tiny sliver of his profile, his hair loose and thick and perfectly straight. And on his arm is a girl in a shining gold dress. When I observe him more closely, I notice that his mouth isn't moving at all. He stays silent throughout the entire pledge. I turn my attention back to the front as applause fills the chamber and Andon begins his prepared speech. From the corner of my eye, I see Day turn to look over his shoulder. My hands tremble at this momentary glimpse of his face. Have I really forgotten how beautiful he is? How his eyes reflect something wild and untamed, free even in the midst of all this order and elegance? When the speech ends, I head straight to Day's direction. He's dressed in a perfectly tailored black military jacket and suit. Is he also thinner? He looks to, to have lost a good 10 pounds since the last time I saw him. He's been ill recently. As I get closer, Day catches a sight of me and pauses in his conversation with his date. His eyes widen a little. I can feel the heat rising on my cheeks, but force it down. This will be our first face-to-face -face meeting in months, and I refuse to make a fool of myself. I stop a few feet away. My eyes wander to his date, a girl who I recognize as Faleen the 18-year-old daughter of Senator Fid Fidelma. Feline and I exchange a quick nod. She grins. Hi, June, she says. You look gorgeous tonight. She makes a genuine smile escape from me, a relief after all the practice smiles I've been giving the other princeps selects. So do you, I reply. Feline doesn't waste a single awkward second. She catches the slight blush on my cheeks and curtsies to both of us. Then she heads back into the crowd, leaving Day and me alone in the sea of people. For a second, we just stare at each other. I break the silence before it stretches on for too long. Hi, I say. I take in his face, refreshing my memory with every little detail. It's good to see you. Day smiles back and bows, but his eyes never leave me. The way he stares sends rivers of heat racing through my chest. Thanks for the invite. Hearing his voice in person again, I take a deep breath reminding myself of why I invited him here. His eyes dance across my face into my dress. He seems ready to comment on it, but then decides against it and waves his hand at the room. Nice little party you have here. It's never quite as fun as it looks, I reply in a hushed voice, so the others can't hear me. I think some of these senators might burst from being forced to talk to people they don't like. My teasing brings a small smile of relief to Dave's lips. Glad I'm not the only unhappy one. Andon has already left the stage, and Day's comment reminds me that I should be escorting him to the banquet room. The thought sobers me. It's almost time, I say, motioning for Day to follow me. The banquet is very private. You, me, the other princeps, selects, and the elector. What's going on? Day asks as he falls into step behind me. His arm brushes once against mine, sending shivers dancing down my skin. I struggle to catch my breath. Focus, June. You weren't exactly specific in our last conversation. I hope put, I'm putting up with all these snobby Congress trots for a good reason. I can't help my amusement at the way Day refers to the senators. You'll find out when we get there and keep your insults to a minimum. I look away from him and toward the small corridor we're headed for, Jasper Chamber, a discreet hall branching, branching away from the main ballroom. I'm not going to like this, am I? Day mutters close to my ear. Guilt rises in me. Probably not. We settle down in the private banquet room a small rectangular cherry wood table with seven seats. And after a while, Serge and Mariana filter in. They each take a seat on either side of Andon's reserved chair. I stay next to Day, as Andon has wished. Two servers go around the table, placing dainty plates of watermelon and pork salad before each seat. Serge and Mariana make polite small talk, but neither Day nor I say another word. Now and then, I manage to steal a glance at him. He's eyeing the lines of forks, spoons, and knives at our place settings. Um, with an uncomfortable frown, trying to figure them out without asking for help. Oh, day. I don't know why this gives me a painful, fluttering feeling in my stomach, or why it pulls my heart to him. I'd forgotten how his long lashes catch the light. What's this? He whispers to me, holding up one of the utensils. A butter knife. Day scowls at it, running a finger along its blunt, rounded edges. This, he muttered, is not a knife. Beside him, Serge notices his hesitation, too. I take it you're not accustomed to forks and knives where you're from, he says coolly to, to him. Day stiffens, but he doesn't miss a beat. He grabs a large curved carving knife, purposely disturbing his place's careful setup 
and gestures casually with it. Both Serge and Mariana edge away from the table. Where I come from, we're more about efficiency, he replies. A knife like this will skewer food, smear butter, and slit throats all at the same time. Of course, Dave's never slit a throat in his life, but Serge doesn't know that. He sniffs in disdain at the reply, but the blood drains from his face. I have to pretend to cough so that I don't laugh at Dave's mock serious expression. For those who don't know him well, his words actually sound intimidating. I also noticed something I hadn't earlier. Day looks pale, much paler than I remember. My amusement wavers. Is his recent illness something more serious than I first assumed? Andon arrives in the room a minute later, causing the unusual stir as we, causing the usual stir as we all rise for him, and gestures for all those of us to take our seats. He's accompanied accompanied by four soldiers, one of whom closes the door behind him and finally seals us into our private meal. Day, Andon greets. He pauses to nod courteously in Day's direction. Day looks unhappy with the attention, but manages to return the gesture. It's a pleasure to see you again, if under unfortunate circumstances. Very unfortunate, Day says in return. I shift uncomfortably in my seat, trying to imagine a more awkward scenario than this dinner setup. Andon sets, lets the stiff reply slide. Let me catch you up on the current situation. He puts his fork down. The peace treaty we've been working on with the colonies is now shelved. A virus has hit the colony's southern warfront cities hard. Beside me, Day crosses his arms and regards the crowd with a suspicious expression on his face. But Andy goes on. They believe this virus was caused by us, and they are demanding that we send them a cure if we want to continue peace talks. Serge clears his throat and starts to say something, but Andy holds up a hand for silence. Then he goes on to spill all the details. How the colonies first sent a harsh me message to the Republic, demanding info on the virus wreaking havoc among their troops hastily withdrawing their affected soldiers, and then broadcasting their ultimatum to the warfront generals, warning of dire consequences if a cure was not delivered immediately. Day listens to all of it without moving a muscle or uttering a word. One of his hands grips the edge of the table tightly enough to turn his knuckles white. I wonder whether he's guessed where it is going and what all of this has to do with him, but he just waits till Andon is finished. Serge leans back in his chair and frowns. If the colonies want to play games with our peace offer, he scoffs, and let them. We've been at war long enough. We can handle some more. No, we can't, Marian interjects. Do you honestly think the United Nations will accept the news that our peace treaty fell apart? Do you think the colonies have any evidence we caused it? Or are these empty accusations? Exactly. If they think we're going to... Day suddenly speaks up, his face turned toward Andon. Let's stop dragging our feet, he says. Tell me why I'm here. He's not loud, but the ominous tone of his voice hushes the conversation in the room. Andon returns his look with an equally grave one. He takes a deep breath. Day, I believe this is the result of one of my father's um, bioweapons, and that the virus came from your brother Eden's blood. Day's eyes narrow. End. Andon seems reluctant to continue. There's more than one reason why I didn't want all my senders in here with us. He leans forward, lowers his voice, and gives Day a humbled look. I don't want to hear anyone else right now. I want to hear you. You are the heart of the people, Day. You always have been. You've given everything you have in order to protect them. Day stiffens besides me, beside me, but Andon goes on. I fear for the people. I worry about their safety. That we'll be handing them over to an enemy just as we're starting to put the pieces together. He grows quieter. I need to make some difficult decisions. Day raises an eyebrow. What kind of decisions? The colonies are desperate for a cure. They will destroy us to get it. Everything both you and I care about. The only chance we have of finding one is to take Eden into temporary. Day pushes his chair from the table and rises. No, he says. His voice is flat and icy, but I remember my old heated argument with Day well enough to recognize the deep fury beneath his calmness. Without another word, he turns from the group and walks away. Serge starts to get up, no doubt to shout at Day for his rudeness, but Andon shoots him a warning stare and motions for him to sit. Then Andon turns to me with a look that says, talk to him, please. I watch Day's retreating figure. He has every right to refuse, every right to hate us for asking this of him. But I still find myself rising from my own chair, stepping away from the banquet table and hurrying in his direction. Day, wait, I call out. My words send me a painful reminder of the last time we'd been in the same room together, when we had said our goodbyes. We head into the smaller corridor that leads out to the main ballroom. Day doesn't turn around, but he seems to slow his steps down in an attempt to let me catch up. When I finally reach him, I take a deep breath. 
Look, I know. Day presses a finger to his lips, silencing me, then grabs my hand. His skin is warm through the fabric of his glove. The feel of his fingers around mine is such a shock after all these months that I can't remember the rest of my sentence. Everything about him, his touch, his closeness, feels right. Let's talk in private, he whispers. We head inside one of the doors lining the corridor, then close it behind us and turn the lock. My eyes do a categorical sweep of the room. Private dining chamber, no lights on, one round table and 12 chairs, all covered in white cloths, and a single large arched window in the back wall that sets in a stream of moonlight. Day's hair transforms in here to a silver sheet. He turns his gaze back to me now. Is this my imagination, or does he look as flustered as I am about our brief handhold? I feel the sudden tightness of the dress waist, the air hitting my exposed shoulders and collarbone, the heaviness of the fabric and the jewels in my hair. Day's eyes linger on the ruby necklace sitting at the small of my throat, his parting gift to me. His cheeks turn a little pink in the darkness. So, he asks, is this seriously why I'm here? Despite the anger in his voice, his directness is like a cool, sweet breeze after all these months of calculated political talk. I want to breathe it in. The colonies refuse to accept any other terms, I reply. They're convinced that we have a cure for the virus, and the only one who might carry the cure is Eden. The Republic's already running tests on other former experiments to see whether they can find anything. Day cringes, then folds his arms in front of his chest and regards me with a scowl. Already running tests, he mutters to himself looking off toward the moonlight windows. Sorry, I can't be more enthusiastic about this idea, he adds dryly. I close my eyes for a moment. We don't have much time, I admit. Every day we don't hand over a cure further angers the colonies. And what happens if we don't give them anything? You know what happens? War. A note of fear appears in Day's eyes, but he still shrugs. The Republic and the colonies have been at war forever. How will this be any different? This time they'll win, I whisper. They have a strong ally. They know we're vulnerable during our transition to a new young elector. If we can't hand this over, if we can't hand over a cure, we don't stand a chance. I narrow my eyes. Don't you remember what we saw when we went to the colonies? Dave pauses for a heartbeat. Even though he doesn't say it out loud, I can see the conflict written clearly on his face. Finally, he sighs and tightens his lips in anger. You think I'm going to let the Republic take Eden again? If the elector believes that, then I really did make a mistake throwing my support behind him. I didn't help him out just to watch him toss Eden back into a lab. I'm sorry, I say. No use trying to convince him of how much Andon also hates the situation. He shouldn't have asked you like this. He put you up to this, didn't he? I bet you resisted too, yeah? You know how this sounds? His tone turns more exasperated. You knew what my answer would be. Why'd you still send for me? I look into his eyes and say the first thing that comes to mind. Because I wanted to see you. Isn't that why you agreed to? This makes him pause for a moment. Then he whirls around, rakes both hands through his hair and sighs. What do you think then? Tell me the truth. What would you ask me to do? If you felt absolutely no pressure from anyone else in this country. I tuck a strand of hair behind my ear. Steal yourself, Jim. I'd... I begin, then hesitate. What would I say? Logically, I agree with Andon's assessment. If the colonies do what they threaten, if they attack us with the full force of a superpower's help, then many innocent lives will be lost unless we take a risk with one life. There's simply no easier choice. Besides, we could ensure that Eden would be treated as well as possible with the best doctors and the most physical comfort. Day could be present during all the potential procedures. He could see exactly what was happening. But how do I explain that to a boy who has already lost his entire family? who saw his brother experimented on before, who's been experimented on himself. This is the part that Andon doesn't understand as well as I do. Even though he knows Day's past on paper, he still doesn't know Day, ha doesn't know Day, hasn't traveled with him and witnessed the suffering he's gone through. The question is too complicated to be answered in simple logic. Most importantly, Andon's unable to guarantee his brother's safety. Everything will come, to, will come with a risk. And I know with dead certainty that nothing in the world could possibly make Day take this risk. Day must see the frustration dancing across my face because he softens and steps closer. I can practically feel the heat coming off of him, the warmth of his nearness that turns my breath shallow. I came here tonight for you, he says in a low voice. There's nothing in the world they could have said to convince me except that you wanted me here. And I can't turn down a request from you. They told me that you would personally, he swallows. There's a familiar war of emotion in his expression that leaves me with a sick feeling. 
emotions that I know are desire for once we would had and anguish for desiring a girl who destroyed his family. It's so good to see you, June. He says it like he's letting go of a huge burden that's been holding him down. I wonder whether he can hear my heart pounding frantically against my ribs. When I speak, though, I manage to keep my voice steady and calm. Are you okay? I ask. You look pale. A weight returns to his eyes, and his brief moment of intimacy fades as he steps away and fiddles with the edges of his gloves. He's always hated gloves, I remember. I've had a bad flu for the last couple weeks, he replies, flashing me a quick grin. Getting better now, though. I flicker subtly to the side, scratching the edge of his ear, stiffness in his limbs, timing slightly off between his words and his smile. I tilt my head at him and frown. You're such a bad liar, Day. You might as well tell me what's on your mind. There's nothing to tell, he replies automatically. This time he points his eyes to the floor and puts his hands in his pockets. If I see him off, it's because I'm worried about Eden. He's gotten a year of treatment for his eyes and he still can't see much. The doctors tell me that he may need some special contacts and even then he might never get his full eyesight back. I can tell this isn't the real reason behind Day's exhausted appearance, but he knows that bringing Eden's recovery into this conversation will stop any questions from me. Well, if he really doesn't want to tell me, then I won't pressure him. I clear my throat awkwardly. That's terrible, I whisper. I'm so sorry to hear it. Is he doing okay otherwise? Day nods. We'll fa we fall back into our moonlit silence. I can't help recalling the last time we were alone in a room together, when he took his, my face in his hands, when his tears were falling against my cheeks. I remember the way he whispered, I'm sorry, against my lips. Now, as we stand three feet apart and stare at each other, I feel the full distance that comes with spending so much time apart, a moment filled with the electricity of a first meeting and the uncertainty of strangers. Day leans toward me, as if drawn by some invisible force. The tragic plea on his face twists my stomach into painful knots. Please don't ask this of me, his ba eyes beg. Please don't ask me to give up my brother. I would do anything else for you, but not this. June, I, he whispers. His voice threatens to break with all the heartache he's keeping bottled inside. He never finished that sentence. Instead, he sighs and bows his head. I can't agree to your elector's terms, he says in a somber tone. I'm not going to hand my brother to the Republic as another experiment. Tell him I'll work with him to find another solution. I understand how serious all, all this is. I don't want to see the Republic fail. I'd be glad to help and figure something else out, but Eden stays out of this. And that's the end of our conversation. Day nods at me, at me in farewell, lingers for a few last seconds, and then steps towards the door. I lean against the wall in sudden exhaustion. Without him nearby, there's a lack of energy, a dulling of color, gray moonlight where moments earlier there had been silver. I study his paleness a final time, analyzing him from the corner of my eye. He avoids my gaze. Something is wrong, and he refuses to tell me what it is. What am I missing here? He pulls the door open. His expression hardens right before he steps out of the room. And for some reason, and if for some reason the Republic tries to take Eden by force, I'll turn the people against Andon so fast that a revolution will be on him before he can blink. All right, and that's where I'm going to stop for today because the next chapter is like really long. <laughs> but yeah, so I guess we'll see what happens. But all right. So we're going to stop there for now. Um, we will continue back up again tomorrow. And then we can talk a little bit tomorrow about um, the chapters that we've been reading. So we'll do at least two chapters tomorrow because those chapters aren't. They're both long chapters. That'll be like 30 pages. Cool. All right. So we will continue tomorrow. All right. So I'll see you guys later. Bye.